So first of all, Saima, thank you for willing to join me for Chai Coffee and Research this afternoon. You are in the UAE and I'm in Pakistan. We have a little bit of time difference, but nevertheless, it works out fine. So I'd like to thank you. Now for the audience who will join us now, will be joining in a few minutes or will later watch us on YouTube. Let me give you an introduction of who my friend and colleague here is. This is Saima Noman. She is currently a postgraduate doctoral researcher at the University of Exeter in the UK. Saima has worked as a lecturer of English in the General Studies Department at the Higher Colleges of Technology in the UAE. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in English literature and holds double master's degree in English language and literature and TESOL studies. Wow, doesn't stop here. Saima also earned two postgraduate diplomas from the UK, one in TEFL and the other in college management. And she is Harvard Higher Education Teaching Certified. Mm -hmm. Not only that, Saima is also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK and a Microsoft faculty fellow. Saima's career, spans over 16 years and it involves teaching and research, of course. And what I'd like to let you know is that she is also well versed in the use of instructional technology. Her primary research interests include educational research, educational technology, and the practical application of tech tools to facilitate active learning for self and for the students. She's also interested in developing interactive curriculums and teacher professional development. Now, speaking about these other interests, Saima will be talking about some of her current research later in the session today. But before that, there's something else she would like to talk about, which is the reason we are here today. So once again, welcome Saima. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to say something to the audience? First of all, I thank you, Naziha, for inviting me for this session. And uh, thank you so much though, for those who are uh, watching me on Facebook Live and also uh, those who are attending uh, this meeting uh, directly. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, talk about my research interests and also the things that uh, we are planning to do in future. And uh, I would love to collaborate with people and with you and those who are interested. So that's why we are here. Thank you one more time. Thank you, Saima. So now I'm going to start with my barrage of questions because I am very interested in sharing everything that you've done in research so far and the chapter that you've got published in our uh, fabulous publication, English Language Teaching in Pakistan. So I'm hoping that this will be a prelude to other research in Pakistan where people like you can support new researchers uh, who are just entering the field. So let's begin with your chapter on, on oral communication skills materials in English language teaching textbooks. This is a very specific area of research and so quite interesting as well. What we notice in your chapter is that you specifically researched the oral communication skills materials in grade 10 textbooks in both private and public schools in Pakistan. Now, could you share with us what prompted you to research this very specific area in English language teaching? Okay, so I remember when I was uh, studying in schools, in Pakistan, of course, I'm a Pakistani. Um, I've been born, bred, and uh, educated in Pakistan. So my all my uh, initial uh, uh, education has been uh, from Pakistan. So when I was in school, I remember that uh, English was the subject that uh, many of our my classmates were really scared scared of. In the exam, the, all the teacher, the whole emphasis of uh, the teachers were uh, to prepare students for English exams. 
I don't know about other subjects, but I remember that um, most of the, my uh, classmates, they would either fail in English or uh, they would just get marks that would just get them to pass the examinations. And uh, on top of that, we, uh, when it come, came to speaking and listening, well, forget listening, just speaking English. Is those, I didn't see too many classmates or uh, even in the, while I was doing in the college and I was doing my FA uh, uh, at that time as well, uh, I couldn't see many students who could, who could uh, speak fluently. Because we have been uh, learning in a grammar translation method and uh, the way the, the, the English, English was taught to us. So I don't know, it is because of that. It, is, it was because of our uh, first language influence. It is the cultural or whatever reason. Well, now I think for what reason, but at that time I couldn't understand for what reason our students couldn't speak fluently. And uh, students were afraid to speak because they were afraid of being uh, ridiculed by others if they spoke uh, um, not in a properly, like uh, theoretically correct way. Um, there were lots of problems which I can pinpoint now, but at that time I couldn't understand. Even myself, I was a bit scared of speaking English. And uh, the same reason being that uh, we were not very fluent in English because we did not use English. Although our um, uh, Pakistani culture, uh, the history, everything uh, says clearly that English is really, really important in our country. It's, it is not only uh, the language of um, uh, uh, judiciary, language of armed forces, language of business and commerce. Our laws are written in English. It is one of the, it is the, um, the one of the official languages of the country. But also there is a uh, cultural uh, associations with English language as well, that, or even though it is not our first language, it is still this, uh, the status symbol. People speak uh, English in Pakistan uh, to, um, to let others know what strat of society we belong to. So it, it, is, uh, it has got this uh, because of the imperialism of English and because of imperialistic past. English has really deep rooted, had saturated in our uh, culture and in our society. Even, uh, um, and I think because of that as well, it is very important for all the students to learn English, not only learn English, but pass the examinations. And also because it is the language of the higher education as well, but also to, uh, as a status symbol. And it is also like many of our Pakistani researchers have, and not only Pakistani, but also other researchers around the world have also established that English is a language that is the language of power. It is a gateway to uh, success. And um, because of all, all of these reasons, English was easy. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you allow me to uh, interrupt now, uh, it looks like all of your own educational experiences in the Pakistani context fueled some of this research. In addition to the fact that you were aware and gradually became a little bit more aware of the fact that students are made to study towards exams. One of our previous speakers, guests on this Chai Coffee and Research session, Dr. Shahziad Nawaz, she mentioned and she in fact highlighted the problems with policies. And um, so the ever changing policies in education, depending on which government is in power. So that is part of the problem. And another thing is that some of the things you've just said about focusing on exam based education is very similar to another chapter in our publication uh, yeah. that I, I worked on this chapter, mediated learning in an exam oriented environment. And this was specifically fo research focused on a Pakistani community school, not in Pakistan, but in the UAE. However, having to follow the same curriculum that was uh, being followed or that is being followed in Pakistan. So they seem to have the same issues. What I'm interested in asking you is, based on these experiences and the amount of research that I've read in this chapter, 
What were some of your key findings or areas that require serious attention in oral communication skills and materials in English language textbooks in Pakistan? Well, um, when I um, actually was researching this and I would, it was really surprising uh, how much uh, these, uh, both of these books that I have uh, used in my research, by the way, one of them is the uh, book that is used in the elitist schools and uh, semi-government schools like uh, armed, uh, those schools or uh, that are under the administration of armed forces. And uh, they are com comparatively, uh, they use immersion as a language of, um, as a medium of teaching. So um, that was that was, um, book is published by uh, Oxford University Press and it is uh, Oxford Progressive English, book nine. And the other uh, book that I used was the, for um, evaluation and was the Punjab Textbook Board uh, uh, published book that is commonly used in the grade 10th. So these were the two, um, two books that I used for the um, evaluation. And uh, when I looked at the, uh, all the numbers and uh, it was really astounding to see that uh, uh, um, the Punjab textbook board uh, book that is being used in the public schools uh, mostly, it has got a really small uh, ratio of uh, oral communication skills, materials and activities as compared to the Oxford uh, Progressive English book. The surprising thing is that although uh, Oxford University Press book is, uh, I mean, very good uh, because it's uh, beautiful to look at, it's very good material and the blurbs and forwards uh, show all the aims and objectives of the book. And it uh, says, it, it proclaims that uh, it has got a lot of uh, all four skills um, enhancement uh, materials and activities. Uh, however, when I um, evaluated the book, I could find that uh, uh, although there are a lot of, uh, it is comparatively much, much better than the uh, textbook board, uh, Punjab, uh, that has been published by Punjab textbook board. Uh, it is still, I would, in the end, uh, the oral communication skills, materials, activities, they are comparatively very few, very, I would say almost uh, next to none in both books. However, compared when I compare both books, um, uh, the book by Oxford University Press, it has got, it still has got uh, a few um, activities. I can tell you that uh, out of the 180 activities in uh, Oxford Progressive uh, English book, 33% were the reading and comprehension activities, 22% uh, were writing activities, only seven out of 180 activities were for speaking. And you will not believe it that one activity, only 1% 1 of the um, whole book, 180 activities were, was the listening activity. And what, did you ever figure out why there was so much, uh, yes. so focus on speaking? Because, like I said, uh, in Pakistan, we used to, well, when I, at the time I did this research uh, um, a few years ago, at that time, the grammar translation method was rife in Pakistan. And the main focus is on reading and writing, like productive skills, because, uh, um, sorry, not reading and writing, uh, they are not, I mean, the, the active skills and the productive skills are more emphasized rather than the uh, passive skills like listening or uh, reading. So um, more emphasis is uh, paid on, um, is given on these uh, two skills. This is why there are more activities in the student, the examination system is uh, designed in a way that it checks only reading and writing activities, reading comprehension, grammar, vocabulary. Listening is one of the skill that like, it. this is uh, justifiably, it is called the umbrella, uh, the, the, um, not umbrella, uh, the Cinderella skills that people people usually ignore this because this is something that is not even being tested. 
and it this thing comes to uh, to light and this deficiency comes to light when our students are about to take uh, admissions in foreign countries or they are giving some foreign examinations uh, or they, when they take tests for the higher education and the listening uh, for example IELTS or uh, MSAT or other kind of exams then this listening skill they, they usually get they I mean this I'm generalizing right now I haven't researched this area uh, for the IELTS exam in exams and other areas, but I do think that based on what I have seen, based on my research, I can say that my our students are they get not very good uh, um, grades or marks in IELTS exams or or the exams where listening is involved. I think this is literally opening up a can of worms here and. Uh one of the purposes of research is to do that. So that's very interesting. You've mentioned quite a few uh, issues and I'm making notes so that, you know, maybe these can be areas for research in the future about speaking skills of uh, students in Pakistan. Uh, so the, allow me to jump to the next question now. I noticed that you utilized two specific types of evaluation techniques to look at these books. Um, so could you just talk us through the relevance of these two strategies? What were the two techniques and why these were critical to your research? Yes, sure. Uh, you know, the importance of uh, textbooks cannot be denied. Uh, there, there is a school of thought uh, in teachers that they use, they are against the uh, textbook use, but, uh, but I personally, I say it, I think that um, textbooks are are, are are very, very important in teaching and not only teaching, but learning language as well, because they provide a framework, they, they guide us through, they, they provide a course of action. So choosing a textbook is really important for the curriculum, for, uh, um, for guiding students. Uh, and uh, if you want your students to um, uh, to, to achieve uh, language proficiency along with fluency, the uh, importance of proper uh, te language textbooks cannot be denied. So um, for the evaluation of the books, because it is a, an important step in uh, the uh, course book selection is very, very important in the curriculum as well. So um, for, the, for the evaluation, I chose uh, Cunningsworth and uh, McGrath's ch checklists, their criteria of course books evaluation. And uh, um, I to actually use Cunningworth's listening and speaking checklist and for the listening and speaking materials. They are uh, uh, benchmarks, they are standards by which we can uh, evaluate a course book. And then uh, we have, I, I use the McGrath's two phase uh, uh, armchair evaluation for the in depth evaluation of the course books, both of them. So, this is the, the, the framework that I used was the combination of this first class uh, and uh, the impressionistic or external evaluation. So, basically, both of these, I will explain in a minute what is the first class and what is the impressionistic uh, evaluation. <clears throat> So the combination of both of these uh, I use to evaluate these books. So I'll explain first the first class evaluation, like the it is self-explanatory that when you look at the book and you see how, what kind of material it is, what kind of paper is being used, is it attractive to the students or uh, the teachers? Does it have uh, the blurb? Does it have a foreword? Does it have aims and objectives in it, uh, uh, specifically stated in on the blurb or the foreword? So all of these uh, things, they uh, how what kind of materials are used? Uh, is it colorful or not? So this is first class evaluation, which uh, when you see a book, you know, this is a famous saying that don't judge a book by its cover. So the cover is really something that attracts uh, the reader. And for students as well and for teachers as well, it is the first class uh, evaluation that, that counts. And then comes the, um, the criteria evaluation that is impressionistic or uh, internal evaluation, in-depth evaluation. So it includes uh, a, um, a few criteria that has got the, this, uh, first of uh, them is the practical considerations. 
um, how the book is going to be used is it uh, practical for uh, the the country or the uh, the the school or the college um, to use it is it practical uh, is it uh, does it support teaching and learning uh, the content is uh, context relevant or not and also what is the learner appeal of that book so all of these criteria they are included in the in depth uh, in depth uh, evaluation i also used uh, the uh, the criteria of uh, it is called the catalyst the, it is an, an acronym with the capitalized catalyst so it is all it comes down to c for communication what are the a for aims what are the aims of this course book what is the teachability and uh, uh, are there any add ons that are available for this book what is the level of learners that is this book is uh, being prepared for what is my the teacher's impression when they look and see this book and uh, what kind of uh, level of uh, interest of students and uh, is it is this book is tried and tested so all of these criteria and the most important that uh, uh, does this book fit into the the standards of national curriculum or not so all of these uh, criteria are very important uh, so i tested this these two evaluated these two books on the national criteria and national curriculum pakistan national curriculum in 2009 because um, later on now we have a single national curriculum coming up and uh, i would really like to uh, see that uh, some of these books are what are the basically standards and criteria of uh, this new curriculum and uh, it's a really interesting area of research that we can i would like to later on uh, invite others to participate in this because that is also something to be researched but still it is not implemented so uh, we still have time to think we have still a lot of books to evaluate and find out if they are suitable or not so before we go ahead to the um, your next question i would just like to uh, explain that national curriculum competency 3 and standard 1 specifically states that english should be used for spoken and written discourse and for all social and uh, academic conventions and english uh, students must be able to uh, use english for various linguistic functions in social environments for example talking uh, group oral presentations formal and informal interviews and other social communications but after the evaluations i found that um, uh, the punjab textbook board uh, bo published book uh, english book 9 english book 10 it was Uh, although it mentions these criteria but it is not uh, at all it doesn't meet the criteria by uh, set by the national curriculum and also by the checklist uh, book, uh, course book evaluation criteria while the other book it has also it has got in the for the first impression uh, the um, first class impressionistic evaluative criteria it uh, meets the criteria and i can use i, I did use it for in depth evaluation but unfortunately uh, the uh, english book 10 that is by the punjab textbook board it did not even meet the first cri first class criteria evaluation criteria and uh, technically theoretically it should not be um, move uh, move forward for the in depth it should be discarded at the first glance evaluation but unfortunately our uh, schools have been teaching that book so i had to uh, um, evaluate the book so that i i could still find out that uh, is it appropriate or not so uh thank you for that detailed response i think from the things that you are saying or the uh the the evaluation criteria that you have used and the findings that have emerged it looks to me like that a lot of it is clearly linked to teacher education and training as well because as english language teachers we know that uh the the way we use textbooks in a classroom are di is directly linked to the way we are trained to use uh english language teaching materials in the classroom so you know it looks like your research is uh shedding light on many many other areas linked to how textbooks can be used in the classroom or why they are utilized now Uh, yeah so you used textbooks uh, from 2009 that were 
you know, those are the ones that you scrutinize. And for the last three or four years, the single national curriculum is being worked on probably three years. But then that's, a, a, you know, that will bring another full set of materials, uh, something new probably, and that will definitely need more research. So perhaps people are interested in uh, looking at speaking skills materials might look at this opportunity to collaborate with someone who's already done some research uh, in this area. So um, now my next question is interesting for me because uh, I, I have, uh, you know, been looking at the way research is done and publishing is done in academia. So what I observe is that a lot of people do research, get published, and then those amazing findings just rest out there. That's it. The objective is to get published. Um, in your case, I'm aware of how you are emerging and evolving. You're still conducting doctoral research and you're trying to get published. And you know, we have a great example here as well. You you've done some amazing work. Now, what was the objective through, well, maybe I should put it in this way, you've got this chapter published internationally, people with interest in this area are definitely going to be interested. So what's next in this area? Well, um, uh, this uh, topic was very interesting, not only personally to me, but I the reason I did it was to highlight this area that uh, needs to be addressed in uh, Pakistani uh, lang English language teaching scenario at all levels, because this book was at the secondary level. I chose uh, for this research, the secondary level, but it, it basically it needs to be started from the primary level. So there's this is a huge area of research that is required. But uh, since you said that the new national single national curriculum is coming up, there would be new materials. So that is a there is a, a whole world coming uh, uh, to us in the if we want to research this area. Now coming back to your question, yeah, I have uh, um, I, I I am I do need to I'm quite very uh, interested in this area, but since I moved uh, forward to. Uh, um, the research uh, area that is now closer to my heart, and although it is in Pakistani context as well. So uh, after doing um, uh, completing this research, and I started another um, way of uh, study that was that is, uh, or when I was working in the in a, in a, uh, in the scenario where uh, educational technology and e-learning is. Uh, the prize of prime importance. So my area of interest also changed a bit. So since this research was done, I have moved forward to the uh, e-learning and uh, educational technology more um, better than this one, but still uh, this area is something that, like I said, that is needs to be researched more. Currently I'm engaged in uh, uh, working on uh, my research that involves uh, Educational technology and uh, e-learning related professional development of teachers. So yeah, uh, I will talk about it uh, more after a while if you allow and we have time. I was definitely interested in that area. You just made me think with your new um, research interest, uh, you know, a lot of uh, ELT materials are moving towards digitized learning resources. So that might be another area to look at in terms of speaking activities or oral communication skills materials in uh, digitized educational resources. It's definitely an area of concern. So I think it's really time, now that you've mentioned your current research, it's really time to let everybody know what exactly are you researching at the moment, your current area of interest. Just, you said ed tech, but just let us know what exactly are you doing in ed tech? So currently I'm working on uh, a project uh, that is concerned with the, uh, basically teach, teachers professional development is uh, one of the area that I'm very much interested in. 
like you know i i am uh, the person who wants to grab the the problem by the roots so like uh, the education the teachers and the textbooks and the policies they are the grassroots level so these things are if you want to change the system or you want to improve some particular system these grassroots or the root level um, areas needs to be researched and fixed if there is a problem so for the teacher professional development is uh, the area that i am most interested in and currently uh, the um, come uh, uh, the professional development that is specifically related to educational technology and e learning that is the thing that you know we have just uh, survived covid 19 it was the pandemic that shut down the whole world it shut down the schools colleges and education and everything was shut down and we had to survive in those hard times so what what was the thing that sustained us it was the technology that sustains us and which uh, you know, we survived those uh, horrible times with uh, because of the uh, technology and educational technology and e-learning was something that uh, sustained our students, not only primary level, but all uh, school levels and even higher education level. So um, a lot of uh, my personal experience is uh, I, I, I have seen a lot of uh, teachers. I have met my conversations with a lot of teachers. They, uh, they were not very comfortable using educational technology. Uh, during pandemic and uh, the professional development training related to this area was almost absent and uh, teachers had to train themselves immediately in emergency. There were uh, four or five days trainings uh, and uh, like crash courses that and we uh, all of us teachers and the students, they had to cope with this these times due to because of the tech. It was only technology that uh, uh, we survived in, in these times, almost two years. And even still now it is going on. Well, fortunately, I've been working in this setup in the environment where uh, educational technology and e-learning, uh, it, it is not an, a problem. Teachers are provided with more than uh, uh, enough uh, professional development related to ed education technology and e-learning. But in many parts of the um, of Pakistan, I came to know my uh, many of my colleagues from Pakistan. They complained there were there were a lot of reasons. Not only the absence of uh, provision of this um, uh, training, but also the teachers' beliefs and uh, the practices, normal practices that that hindered. So a lot of uh, teachers, they had problems, quite a lot of problems coping with this transition from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online learning. And for online learning, you had to be familiar with the educational technology and e-learning, how to use the hardware, how to use the softwares, how to use different applications on computer, or on your mobile devices so that you are able to teach your students uh, uh, effectively. So that I found that there is a big uh, a lack of uh, professional development related to this particular area and uh, somebody had to do something. So I am now in search of uh, teachers perspectives and I'm also um, working to collect some numerical data, quantitative data as well and uh, to um, find out actually to evaluate what is the professional development system currently going on in Pakistan related to educational technology and e-learning. How, if there is uh, some uh, requirement uh, to improve the system, uh, what are teachers needs and uh, how can the system be improved if required? So what are the findings, so far, whatever you've discovered, what are these findings pointing to? Well, so far, uh, um, uh, like my assumption uh, was that uh, there is a lack of uh, professional development training um, in this specific area related to uh, education technology and e-learning. I call it EPD. So um, there, there is a, this was my assumption. This is why I started this uh, research project that uh, is there any uh, lack of the specific EPD training? And if there is, what can be done to fix this problem? 
So, so far my data, uh, quantitative and quantitative, both data sets, they are showing that my assumption is correct. So, um, although the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan uh, on the website, uh, it, it, uh, it has given a lots and lots of uh, resources for teachers to train themselves, self-training resources. But specifically, um, and they have lots and lots of programs as well for teacher training programs. But unfortunately, these programs, they are, um, so they, they choose teachers selectively, not, it is not available to all higher education teachers or because my area for this research project is the uh, higher education level. So not all this um, training is not available to everyone. So there are lots and lots of problems and this area is still something so, that uh, needs for one sentence could you repeat what you've just said last i was saying that although there are lots and lots of resources uh, from the uh, higher education commission of pakistan and also a lot of uh, um, uh, ample uh, um, professional development training is also provided but the unfortunate thing is that uh, they are not available to all the higher education faculty. So they are, these programs, they are uh, made available to universities and universities choose a few uh, people from, uh, from their university and then from, uh, they are the representatives basically, for example, two, three or four people, or uh, let's say a group of seven, people are chosen from one university and then all of those are given some specific training which they are supposed to go to other uh, to their universities and cascade that training but um, um, my data so far is showing that whatever training is being obtained it is very limited it is not enough uh, teachers are facing a lot of problems they had to engage in the epd themselves they spend a lot of time and energy and money on getting these trainings themselves to survive in the system. Whereas uh, the, the training from the universities and uh, the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan is not enough. And it, uh, there are lots of problems in the, in the provision. I'm curious, uh, do you think the findings might have been different if there was no COVID involved? I think that if there was no COVID involved, there wouldn't have been much research on this area because it is taken for granted because the Higher Education Commission uh, website uh, and also their charter, their policies, they, sh they show clearly that there is a lot of uh, uh, professional development training already going on. And for specifically for e-learning also, there are, there are quite a lot of courses there. But the thing again is that they are not available to everyone. The, Training is available, but it is not enough. It is not available to everyone. Not all the faculties involved in those trainings. Whereas in, I think that this training should be provided and should be available to all school levels, uh, secondary levels and higher education level to all, the, all teachers. Because te educational technology is something that, uh, that is not going anywhere anytime in the future, COVID or no COVID. Is this, a, it, it looks like this sheds a little bit of light on the kind of the critic arrangements involved uh, when you say that some people are getting it, some are not getting it, and somebody else makes the decision. So um, I know you're still in the midst of your data reorganizing and analyzing. So I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be a lot more to share soon where you will actually find out what the solutions to these things might be. Thank Unless you. If, you have, if you think you might have some understanding of what a solution or a suggestion might be, you're welcome to share it in this forum, which is, this is part of the reason why we're doing these sessions so that you know, there can be, these, your research can point towards further research. Sure, I think we do. So that might be a very good thing to do. Now, speaking of future research, if you were to think of collaborating in research and publication, so I know you're deeply involved in your current research. So what sort of areas specifically would you encourage 
you know, your colleagues or friends to get involved in with you if you were to do a collaborative research project or publication, what areas would interest you with other people, not necessarily in Pakistan, just, you know, generally. So um, uh, my main area of uh, uh, interest in research are the first, like I said, it's the teacher professional development uh, and educational technology specifically uh, currently. But also I'm very much interested in the workplace and educational policies. I am very much interested, well, I could say uh, after this educational technology and e-learning, my the second most uh, interesting uh, to me is the critical issues in language teaching and, and, and especially in the workplace environment and educational policies. So I, I would love to collaborate with the people. I have done some research, but that is in the United Arab Emirates context where I'm working and living right currently. I would love to uh, collaborate with uh, researchers uh, and teachers, uh, those who want to work in these areas, like for example, the uh, workplace policies. You know, our teachers, uh, when I was doing my interviews for my current research, a lot of other uh, areas of research sprung up and I found out that uh, there is a lot of politics going on in the educational, higher education institutions. There is a lot of uh, uh, favoritism or uh, these type of things were, were going on. And this is something that I'm very much interested in. So workplace politics and, uh, and sometimes teachers were felt that they, teachers felt that they were being discriminated in some way. So these are the areas of, that kept them from attaining those opportunities uh, for professional development. So this is something that I would really like to work on and I would love to collaborate with others if, uh, and especially in Pakistani context right now, because I am uh, quite familiar with the context. I lived there, I was born there, I was married there, I was educated there. So I really am interested in the context. So I have done, uh, done already some work in the United Arab Emirates context, but I would love to work in this area and I would be uh, you're most welcome those who want to uh, contact uh, me in this uh, regard. I'm wondering if this, um, all the areas that you mentioned as part of uh, educational management in the higher education industry, I'm wondering if these are common to our region or common to generally across academic institutions of higher education worldwide. That might be another interesting aspect to look at. Well, so, my research does show that it is common because I did uh, one project here uh, in the United Arab Emirates context, and I found out uh, that's very interesting research. Then it is quite controversial as well because people do not like to talk about that area, and especially if they talk about it, they don't want to publish this because of the various political or uh, 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 situational reasons. So yeah, this is something that uh, is uh, some sensitive topic. Yeah, I think one has to be really careful. So I think at this stage- But I would still say that if something is sensitive or critical, it doesn't mean that it does not need to be researched. Mm -hmm. Things need to come out uh, eventually and uh, we need to address the issues that are already there. So this, uh, that uh, topic that I talked to you about that and my, um, participants in Pakistan, they hinted at the same was happening in the other context as well. So yeah, I can say that uh, there are quite a lot of similarities in this. <laughs> it's interesting how much uh, data emerges from when you're looking at one specific area, right? Uh, do you know what I want to do? I know she, uh, I can see Shifa here and I know she's in a totally different context. So I actually would love Shifa to, if, if you don't mind, Shifa, to add something from your, your own context about the various things that we've spoken about. Yes, thank you, uh, Saima and uh, Nazia. Um, well, uh, actually, I had two totally unrelated questions just uh, following the conversation. So is it okay if I ask the questions that are in my head first? Okay, so I actually have a question uh, for, for both, for each of you. And my area of research interest is teacher well-being. So my questions are always kind of existentialist based. So Saima, I, 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 from your talk, I gather that you are you work full time at HCT. 
you study, and also you have a personal life. So as someone who, who, uh, who does all of that, I'm, I'm just curious, just from a, a practical perspective, how does one balance, how does a teacher balance all of that that is expected of her? What has been your experience? Well, I would say, man, you are on your own. <laughs> because as far as the institutional um, support is uh, concerned, I there are big words, but no practical support. Support is if you, you want to maintain the work-life balance, you want to avoid the burnout, but you don't get enough. I mean, nobody is going to give you uh, the uh, hours where less teaching load. Of course, you are going to be paid according to your teaching load. Teaching load cannot be reduced. If the teaching load is reduced, then uh, especially in the country where I'm working, that uh, there is no job security. So less teaching load means you don't know you're working there next year. So this, um, uh, a lot of things uh, uh, are there because of uh, those factors. Teacher well-being, it is uh, a much talked about um, topic, but uh, practically I don't see anything. So whatever the, the teacher is doing to sustain themselves to, for self-preservation, they are doing themselves. So for, for, for example, if you ask me, I had classes starting in the morning, uh, eight o'clock. Well, my workplace is about one and a half hour away from my home. So I have to drive. And then um, I take the classes and then there was no institutional support for me that I my timetable should be in a way that I have to return to my home. So three hours commute, there wasn't any. So, uh, and my classes finished at about 6.30 in the evening and I would reach home at eight o'clock. So it would completely, it burnt me out. So these, these were the things. And uh, I mean, a lot of requests to the administration, to the higher administration everywhere. Uh, no, nothing, the support is, this is my personal experience. I cannot generalize it, but usually, um, the, the conversation with my colleagues and uh, even from outside of my institution, um, teachers, faculty were reporting that uh, there, is, there are lots and lots of charters and policies and big words on the websites and everywhere about the teacher well-being. But yeah, they sent emails that you should go to one hour in the gym and you should go to, uh, to you go and relax in the, uh, in the uh, uh, staff lounges or what. I mean, yes, of course, teachers, have, they, they, if they need to survive, they, they must take some time off. But they are, I think all the efforts are on uh, faculty's part themselves. They have to manage time. They have to cope up with everything. So like in my uh, example, I did not have time to work on my project. So my research that was supposed to be finished within three years, it is still lagging on because I did not have time. So when I would reach home, I'm a, I'm a, a homemaker as well. So I have um, children, I have my uh, home to take care of. I, would, I was not able to uh, cope with everything. So I had to take leave. Definitely I have to uh, manage, I have to survive. I have to retain my sanity. So these are the things that are very critical. This is why I said that this is a critical issue. In, uh, in, in language teaching and especially in academia as well. So these are some things that need to be addressed. It is. Um... Thank you, Simon. Yeah, that uh, I'm, I'm always interested in people's personal uh, reflections on, on just how difficult it is to choose to be a researcher plus teaching, plus teaching. And that's obviously one of the reasons why a lot of teachers don't venture into into uh, research. Uh, my next question is, yeah, is actually for you. And it was uh, something that you mentioned about when once, once you publish something, that's kind of the end goal. You do, it's in this, and it's then it's kind of put on the back burner and then what happens? So, um, you know, uh, this, is, this is something that, that I, I ponder about a lot is about the, the amount of effort that it takes to produce a piece for publication. And then you go through those that motion and it's 
several weeks, months of, of effort and hard work, and then you get to that point where perhaps it, it is published, then what? So seeing that you raised this, I was just wondering if you think that, uh, if you had any thoughts about, um, is it just an end in itself? Is that how we should treat a piece of research? Uh, and then, you know, there's not, not a whole lot you can do beyond that. Uh, did you have, in seeing that you raised the question, I just suspected that maybe you had a hidden answer. Yes and no, and thank you for bringing that up because a lot of what I do, uh, this thing is at the core, this issue is at the core of what I often do. I live in a context, at least for the last four and a half years, I've lived in a context where the situation is as I described it in my question. So one of the objectives of getting published in a journal is to be able to move up in the ranks, the academic ranks, which means if you have, up until last year, they, there was a condition from our Higher Education Commission in Pakistan to have at least five uh, published papers in, in um, journals um, so that you could be received as an assistant professor, 10 to be an associate, and 15 to be a full professor. Now, that has created a competitive situation where um, people are just trying to produce something that can be published in any category of journals. And, it can, you know, so this has created a very unpleasant environment. And I can speak about it because some of the papers I I do review and edit work. And so, so the quality of some of the papers that I've looked at shocks me to see that a person with a title to their name and a person who is public produce something that I'm actually looking at and that would give them an academic rank. It shocks me. It's also created a situation which is universal. It's not just uh, in our region, it's created a situation where seniors ask the juniors to do all the work and write the papers and then add their name because they're the seniors and that guarantees a job security. Recently, I saw somebody post the name of a dean on LinkedIn because social media is volatile now. So they posted the name of someone on LinkedIn to say that this person offered me a job on the condition that I would publish their name on my work and I'm not doing it, but I'm posting it here so that I let everybody know. So, you know, things like those. So I am aware of this situation. For me, this makes me feel like I don't like that feeling because I have worked so hard and spent 20 years in the field to be able to get to the, you know, academic position that I'm in, to be able to talk about these things, support other researchers. Now, when I started these online sessions, the chai coffee and research, the main objective, which I state at the start and end of every session is, the main objective is now that I've helped so many emerging and existing academics publish their work to the international world, it's now people outside Pakistan know about the research that is going on in Pakistan. Now I've created a platform where I'd like my authors to come and talk about their work and just openly invite others to come forward for collaborations, which means I'm trying to encourage genuine research in Pakistan. I'm trying to encourage collaborations where people can work without the, uh, the stress of just wanting to get published and then help them publish this in international publications or journals rather than just what exists in this, this one country. And for me, that's it's, it takes a lot of time, but I'm making the effort. Someone has to take the first step. So all my conversations on this forum, the Chai Coffee and Research are a small step towards helping people not just conduct research and then just let it lie there because they've received their ranks or because they can get juniors to do it, but to actually make some difference uh, in the field, like, you know, 
I did a lot on teacher education and I've put it to good use by helping teachers develop themselves. I've done it for free. I've done it uh, as part of the university work. So, you know, I'm trying and I'm hoping this will encourage a few other colleagues to do something similar or at least form collaborations that can create, help generate meaningful research. Thank you. Yeah, that's that definitely does go a, 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 a lot further than just the publication and then that's the end of it. Yeah, so, it opens up the conversation around that space. It does. And also, uh, Shifa, because you mentioned well-being in your first question, and that's another area close to my heart, I just want to let you know that um, uh, in one of the upcoming sessions, I will be inviting somebody over to talk about uh, teacher well-being and burnout, you know, so you might be interested in that as well. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Well, as long as you keep posting, uh, you know, your, your invitations on LinkedIn, I'm bound to find them. Right. So what I've done is I've just shared Simon's chapter in the chat box, and uh, I will definitely keep posting updates, but I'm also going to share with you a Google Doc. I think you may have entered your details there in the past. And if not, then you're welcome to do that now because I'll, I just email everybody who's uh, shared their contact with us. Um, right, I don't have you there, but I'm definitely going to share it with you right now so that you can just enter your email. So this will come to you as well. Mm -hmm. I can see that somebody else has been trying to connect for a while, but it still says connecting audio. So here is the link again in the chat box. There you go. It's a Google Doc spreadsheet. Just put in your name and email and I'll make sure the information comes to you. These are monthly uh, sessions. We just stopped in December. Okay. So Shireen, if you can hear us, uh, you're very welcome to the session, but it seems like you're still connecting. Um, I think this is a good time to close the session. So I really want to thank you, Saima, for making time for this. I know doctoral research is difficult. And so I completely stopped every professional activity when I did my doctoral research. But thank you for making time. And also to those who joined on Facebook Live and here. And this, this session will definitely be on my YouTube channel. I'm here. This is my YouTube handle. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. I'd love to see you there and I will share my um, uh, the video of this session right there as soon as I have it off Zoom. Thank you for also for your contribution. And thank you, Shireen. Thanks for inviting me, Naziha, again. And uh, hopefully there will be more uh, very fruitful research talks like this, chat and chai and coffee. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to that. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Bye everyone, bye-bye.